Hello, happy to be here with you tonight. My name is Crystal Taves. I'm the pastor of discipleship here at Northview. I've uh, been here for a couple of years and it's my pleasure to get to teach every once in a while to the precept group. Um, so I'm glad to be here. Uh, for those of you who know me, you know that I have three adult kids. Um, my, I have a, a boy who's 25 and my daughter Jessica is 22, turning 23, and then a younger son Trevor who's turning 21. Uh, my daughter Jessica is engaged uh, to a guy named Adam, who's our young adults uh, immersed intern here at Northview. And it's funny how as you bring someone new into the family, you start thinking about and talking about kind of all your family favorites. And so one thing we've been talking about is some of our favorite movies that we've watched as a family. And Adam, um, to our sh sheer horror and shock, we hadn't kind of screened him on this before, he entered the family. He has not watched the Pink Panther movies, which are the uh, Inspector Clouseau, Jack Clouseau movies, uh, a bumbling French detective, and we were shocked to know that he hadn't watched them. But as we have been talking to him about the movies, it kind of reminded us of this character of Jacques Clouseau. And so as I was reading the book of Jonah, I kind of thought, Jonah's kind of like Jacques Clouseau. He's kind of like this bumbling prophet who kind of gets everything wrong, but in the end, it all kind of turns out right for him. Somehow, the circumstances work in his favor that, that he's the one that kind of gets the job done where all these prophets have failed in the sense that they have proclaimed the truth of God's word, but people haven't repented. Jonah has this crazy experience where people actually do repent, and yet he is not totally sold about it. And so we're going to look at the story of Jonah today. We're going to look at the story of this bumbling prophet. And uh, the big idea of this book is that God is more compassionate than his people. It's a surprising story. It's a surprising twist. But the big idea is that God is more compassionate than his people. So we're going to look through the book um, kind of in two sections. First of all, I want to give you a picture of the world of Jonah. So the world that was kind of swirling around him as he was engaging in these activities. And then secondly, the message of Jonah. And then we're going to break up the message of Jonah into two spots. So I'll spend a few minutes just on the world of Jonah. And then we'll go into the message of Jonah. So the world of Jonah, the world of politics in Jonah's time, um, if you had done any study kind of around uh, finding his name within the Bible and other places, he's mentioned in 2 Kings 14, which is a story about him prophesying to King Jeroboam about the borders being extended in the nation of Israel. So we know if you've studied the kings and prophets, which you guys have been doing so diligently, you know that King Jeroboam the second time was a time where Israel was relatively prosperous, when there was a, quite a bit of safety in the land. There might have been some border skirmishes, but there wasn't like all out warfare. And so Jonah was speaking in this time. He was a prophet to the nation of Israel. He was from a town called Gath Hefer, which is in the northern kingdom, just kind of on the coast. And... Um, even in this middle of this kind of politically stable time, uh, we know, those of us who've studied the prophets, that there was a lot of stuff going on inside the hearts of the people of Israel. Uh, there was idol worship, there was extortion, there was social justice issues that have come up in other books, uh, like Joel, uh, in, this, in this prophetic scroll. And so uh, it's a time of outward prosperity, but inward kind of rotting. The story, or the, the city of Nineveh, which is a city that Jonah is going to go eventually speak to, was eventually became the capital city of the nation of Assyria. So it wasn't yet, but later on in, I think it's 2 Kings 16, it's talked about as the capital of Assyria. It is a city or a, a nation, it's kind of a mounting threat to Israel. So they have not yet really appeared on the sea in Israel. They haven't yet been a physical threat to Israel, but they're kind of growing in power in the east and Israel kind of has an uneasy feeling about them. And so if you think of in our modern day political circles, if you think of a country like North Korea, where they're kind of growing in power, we kind of know about them, they're kind of in the, in, the side of our, in the side of our minds, but they haven't actually threatened us, but we're not quite sure what's going to be the result of our inter, interaction with this group of people. The Assyrians at that time, they were known for producing like psychological warfare. They didn't do a lot of hand-to-hand -hand combat. They didn't do siege warfare. They were all about intimidation. And so they would circle around a city and they would just yell and scream and try to intimidate the people in the city. And if they couldn't intimidate the people in a walled city, they would go to a city next door that might have been less fortified and they would just do horrible things to the people in that city, um, mutilate, rape, burn the lands, um, infect the crops, whatever they could do in order to kind of teach this walled city what they would do to them if they ever got them. And so their big tactic was intimidation, was psychological warfare. Eventually, um, after, you know, a couple decades after this, this book of Jonah, they would deport and conquer about four or five million people that would just be kind of assimilated into their kingdom. And they would destroy Israel in 722 uh, BC. So that's about 30, 40 years from when Jonah is coming, was, was when Jonah's on the scene. So that is still in the future. Jonah doesn't know about this, but that is the country, that is the city that he is asked to engage with by God. 
in terms of that's a political world of Jonah, in terms of the literary world of Jonah, there were prophets throughout this time, as you've been studying, they were speaking and writing oracles of judgment, judgment against Israel and judgment against the nations around Israel. And these oracles over time, they were collected and they were put all together into one book. And so the minor prophets or the scroll of 12 was basically considered one biblical book. And they were organized kind of prophet after prophet after prophet written in this one biblical book. They were recognized to be kind of commenting on each other and explaining each other and being kind of seen together as one literary corpus. So Paul House, who's done a lot of work on this, kind of has the most accepted view of how these books were organized. And, and he says the first six books, which Jonah is in the middle of that one, or right near the end, is about the nature of sin, both within the covenant community and within the cosmos. The next three books uh, talks about the reality of God punishing. And the final three books talk about the possibility of redemption. And so we see Jonah situated within this section of books that's all about the nature of sin within the covenant community, within the cosmos. Uh, Jonah is specifically paired with Obadiah in every kind of, in the Greek translations and in the Hebrew translations, it's specifically paired with Obadiah. And commentators think it's because Obadiah talks about uh, God bringing judgment on a foreign nation, uh, the nation of Edom or Esau, because this nation gloats over the destruction of Israel's capital which is Jerusalem. So this idea that they're glorifying, they're, they're loving the fact that their capital city of the enemy has been destroyed. And in Jonah, we see the opposite, where an Israelite, Jonah, hopes for the destruction of their enemy's capital city, uh, the, city of Assyria, or the city of Nineveh in, in the nation of Assyria. And so then the um, kind of message by pairing these two books together is that the world gloats in Obadiah, that Israel gloats in the book of Jonah, Together, the cosmos and the covenant community is sinful. Nobody is without fault and everybody needs to repent. That's the literary world that we're entering into as we read the book of Jonah. Uh, the physical world that we're entering as we read the book of Jonah is one in which God is meticulously sovereign over everything that happens. And we see throughout the book, God appointing things. He appoints or he sends a storm. He appoints a plant to grow. He appoints a fish. Uh, to swallow Jonah. He appoints a worm to destroy the plant. He appoints a scorching east wind uh, to take away Jonah's comfort. He is in all things. He works through all things. And he's demonstrating throughout the book that he is more compassionate than his people. So that is the world of the book of Jonah. Now we want to get into the message of it. What is the book telling us? Now I'm going to do just a broad strokes overview. I know you guys have spent a week working through this. I'm not going to read every single verse in it, but I'm going to read some of the highlight verses and I'm going to summarize um, some of the pieces in between. So we're going to look at it in two parts. The message of Jonah is, like I said, God is more compassionate than his people. That's overarching method, message. Jonah 1 to 3, we have, uh, it's all about God saving. And Jonah 4 is about Jonah complaining. And so we're going to look at it under those two headings. God saves, Jonah 1 to 3, and Jonah complains, Jonah 4. God is more than compassionate than his people. So first of all, God saves. We open up the book to chapter one of Jonah verse one, and we read these words. Now the word of the Lord came to Jonah, the son of Amittai saying, arise, go to Nineveh, that great city and call out against it for their evil has come up before me. So people that would be familiar with the old Testament, hearing these words for the first time, they might've thought back to Genesis 18 when similar kind of imagery comes up. If you remember the story of Genesis 18, Abraham is met by some men who he eventually finds out is the Lord and some angels, and they are bent on going to Sodom to check it out, to see whether or not what they have heard from heaven is correct about the nature, the, the city of Sodom. In Genesis 18, 20 to 21, it says this, the Lord said, behold, or because the outcry against Sodom and Gomorrah is great and their sin is very grave, I will go down to see whether they have done altogether according to the outcry that has come to me, and if not, I will know. The city of Sodom had an outcry that came up to, to the Lord, and God in Jonah 1 is saying that the outcry against the city of Nineveh has come up to him, and so these cities are kind of being paralleled. In the story of Genesis 18, we have Abraham so um, concerned about the people in Sodom, especially because his nephew Lot is there, and he intercedes for them. But in the city or the book of Jonah, we see an opposite response. And so the story opens with almost these expectations being set up. Will, will Jonah intercede? Will God actually bring judgment like he does on Sodom? But as we go into the story, we realize that the story is all upside down and it's all topsy-turvy. 
So instead of Jonah interceding like Abraham, Jonah flees from the word of the Lord. And instead of judging, God eventually shows mercy. So Jonah flees. Um, if you followed it on a map, which you probably did going through your homework, he flees from Gath Heifer down to Tarshish and wants to head across to Joppa, going directly opposite to uh, directly west, whereas Nineveh was directly in the east. God is not happy about this, and so he whips up a storm in the sea. And the mariners that are on board with Jonah, who are running the boat, they are initially afraid of the storm. The storm is huge, and they're freaked out about it. And so they question Jonah. They ask him to be part of interceding for them, to perhaps intercede on behalf of their God. They realize that Jonah is a prophet of Yahweh, and then their fear changes from being afraid of the fear of the storm to being afraid of the fear of God, of Yahweh, because they know that he is a Lord that is over the heavens and the earth. Jonah offers to, to get sent overboard. They try to save him instead. Um, they try to save themselves, and they finally throw themselves on God's mercy and throw Jonah overboard, and they're saved. The last few verses of this chapter read like this, verse 14 to 16. Therefore, they called out to the Lord. These are, this is the mariner speaking. O Lord, let us not perish for this man's life and lay not on us innocent blood. For you, O Lord, have done as it pleased you. So they picked up Jonah and they hurled him into the sea and the sea ceased from its raging. Then the men feared the Lord exceedingly and they offered a sacrifice to the Lord and made vows. We see in this first chapter that the storm whips up and the mariners are the ones who respond properly to it. They become afraid of God rather than afraid of the storm, and they throw themselves on the mercy of the Lord. And in chapter one, we see that God saves the mariners because the Lord saves all who call. Chapter two starts actually in verse one or chapter one, verse 17. The story kind of goes on into chapter two. God appoints a fish to, to swallow up Jonah when he comes in over the, when he gets thrown in over the ocean from the people in the boat. And we have this poem, which kind of symbolizes or pictures Jonah descending into the deep. If you read the poem, it seems like he's getting deeper and deeper and deeper as the poem goes on. He talks about first being cast into the deep and then the flood surrounds him. And then he talks about the waters closing in over him and the weeds wrapping around his head and he went down to the land and yet almost like when he hits bottom, he says, when my life was fainting away, verse seven, I remembered the Lord and my prayer came to you. And as he ruminates, as he reflects on the Lord and the beauty of serving the Lord, he finally ends with his affirmation, salvation belongs to the Lord. And it's written as if in response to that proclamation, God acts. And the Lord speaks to the fish and it vomits Jonah onto the dry land and, and Jonah is saved. And so in Jonah 2, we see again, God saves all who call. In scene three, it's almost like uh, we get a repeat of, of chapter one. Chapter three begins the same kind of way as chapter one did. Then the word of the Lord came to Jonah the second time saying, arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and call out against it the message that I tell you. This time, instead of rising to flee, so Jonah arose and went to Nineveh according to the word of the Lord. And so the expectation of Israel, if they're thinking again of this outcry of Sodom and Sodom being judged, is that maybe now, God would judge Nineveh. But instead, Jonah enters the city. Uh, the author makes note of the fact that he only gets one third of the way in. It's a three day journey across and he only goes one day in. He makes a, a very short sermon. So in Hebrew, it's only five words. In English, it's eight words. Very short sermon compared to the books and books that you've read before with long sermons of God's oracles. And the people repent. Surprise, surprise, Jacques Clouseau, the Pink Panther, somehow his unorthodox efforts work. And the people believe God. The king issues a decree to show how seriously he has taken this news from Jonah. And he says in verse, uh, the end of verse seven, that neither man nor beast, herd nor flock, taste anything. Even the animals are supposed to repent in Jonah. Let them not feed or drink water, but let man and beast be covered with sackcloth and let them call out mightily to God. Let everyone turn from his evil way and from the violence that is in his hand. And who knows? God may return and relent and turn from his fierce anger so that we may not perish. The words that are put into the Assyrian king's mouth, who knows God may turn and relent, were words also spoken by the prophet Joel, a few books earlier in this prophetic scroll. Joel 2, verse 12 to 14 says, these are the words that are spoken to Israel. Yet even now, declares the Lord, return to me with all your heart, with fasting, with weeping and with mourning, who knows whether he will turn and relent and leave a blessing behind him. 
So in the book of Joel, in the prophetic prophecies of Joel, he talks to Israel and he says, listen to my words. Let's fast, let's weep, let's mourn, and God may relent. And now in the book of Jonah, we hear the king of Nineveh, a pagan king, saying to his people, let's fast, let's weep, and let's mourn, and God may relent. So the result of the king's words is that the people of Nineveh threw themselves on God's mercy and God saved them. And the chapter ends in Jonah 3 verse 10. It says, when God saw what they did, how they turned from their evil way, God relented of the disaster that he had said he would do to them. And he did not do it because God saves all who call. Chapter one, chapter two, chapter three. This is a theme throughout that whole scroll of 12 and throughout the whole Bible. In Joel 2.32, uh, Joel says, It shall come to pass that everyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. In John 3.16, when Jesus is talking to Nicodemus, he says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. And Peter, in his first sermon in Pen- after Pentecost, he quotes, at, or he quotes Joel to start off his sermon. And as he ends, he ends with these words in Acts 2, 38. Peter said to them, repent and be baptized, every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. And you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit for the promise is for you and your children and for all who are far off, everyone whom the Lord our God calls to himself. God saves all who call. In Jonah 1, God saves the pagan mariners. In Jonah 2, God saves a problematic prophet. In Jonah 3, God saves the political enemies because God saves all who call. So the message of Jonah 1 is good news for people in our midst who are maybe agnostic, our kind of agnostic acquaintances. Uh, The pagan mariners are not deliberately against God. They're not deliberately God's enemies. They're basically just doing their job. They're doing what they've kind of been brought up to do. Um, They're worshiping what they know. But they're confronted by this power of Yahweh, Israel's God, and they respond rightly to it. They fear him. They throw themselves on God's mercy and are saved. So do we know people like that? Do you know people that this would be good news for? Sometimes we assume that everybody is against the gospel, that everybody is against Jesus, and we don't know that perhaps within our midst there's people that just actually don't know anything about him, that are just kind of going about their business, and they're not necessarily actively against God, but they don't really know who they should follow. So a couple years ago, I was taking Greek in a summer class at Regent College, and every day I would go on the SkyTrain, or sorry, the, the West Coast Express back and forth from Mission to Vancouver and then take the bus in. And there was about a three-hour lag between when my class was done and when I could come home on the West Coast Express. And so I would sit outside, uh, kind of by the Stanley Park area, by a Pan Pacific area, and I would do homework there on the tables. And one day a woman came up to me and just asked what I was doing and what I was studying. And she had all kinds of questions about Christianity and a friend that had gone off to uh, Bethel School of Music and a bunch of people that knew different things. And she just really didn't know how to sort through it. She didn't know how to sift through it. She didn't know how to believe an ancient book, um, how to know whether or not it was trustworthy and true. And so this woman, I think, would be like these pagan mariners somebody who just really didn't know what she believed and was kind of going about their business. And so the book of Jonah is good news for a woman like her. It's the good news that if she learns how to call on the name of the Lord, that she can be saved. And so I encouraged her, I said, read the gospel of Mark and see if you can believe that this is a trustworthy witness. And if she does, and she calls on God's name, if he draws her to herself, she will be saved. The message of Jonah is, too is also good news for the people of God. So God saved this prophet who had a problem, who was trying to run away from him. And some of us have acted like Jonah. Some of us have turned our back on God. Some of us have attempted to flee from his presence. Some of us has, have read his word, have read his revealed word to us, and we have stomped our feet and ang- been angry with what God calls us to do. We haven't wanted to do it. We haven't wanted to accept it. We maybe don't want to engage with people of other faiths. We don't want to put our life on hold or our plans on hold or our comfort on hold for his mission. We don't want to be uncomfortable. We don't want to do anything risky. Uh, There's a time in my life before I came here on staff on Northview where I'd done some women's ministry stuff in the past and there had been kind of a couple things that had kind of gone sideways with that. There was things in my own personal life that were not ideal. 
Uh, we were working through some financial stuff with my husband's business. We were working through some marriage stuff and related to that financial stuff. And I felt like life was really in limbo. And I basically said to God, I'm not going to go into ministry until you solve these things for me. Until I know that I will be walking on solid ground when I go into ministry. And so for a number of years, I feel like I was being like Jonah. I was putting up my hand and saying, no, Lord, I'm not going to do this until you come through. And so this is good news. The book of Jonah is good news for people like us who maybe have followed God, and yet we've kind of put them on the shelf for a while. Because even us, God saves all who call. The message of Jonah 3 is good news for the enemies of God. And this is where Jonah gets touchy. This is where Jonah gets dicey. Even the Assyrians, even the people that engage in psychological warfare, this is where the story of Jonah gets hard. God is more compassionate than his people. There's a story that Corrie Ten Boom tells. Uh, Corrie Ten Boom was a woman who was uh, put into the concentration camps, not because she was Jewish during World War II, but she, because she harbored Jews in her home. And she was put into concentration camps. Her sister died there, and she survived. And at the end of it, she became um, kind of a famous speaker, going about talking about her experience there and talking about how God sustained her through these concentration camps. And at the end of one of her meetings where she was talking about God's forgiveness and the, the fact that she'd been able to forgive people that had been uh, put her in there, uh, an actual guard from Ravensbrück um, concentration camp where she was in came up to her and she recognized him immediately. And, and her fear just kind of welled up in her as she recognized this enemy. And the man st uh, stuck out his hand to her and said to her, you mentioned Ravensbrück in your talk, he was saying. I was a guard in there. And she reflects, oh, he didn't remember me. She wasn't sure right away as if he remembered her. But since that time he went on, I've become a Christian. And I know that God has forgiven me for the cruel things I did there. But I would like to hear it from your lips as well, Fraulein. And again, the hand came out, will you forgive me? And the message of Jonah is asking that question. Even them? God, will you forgive? Even them. Even the guard at Ravensbrook. Even the Assyrians. This is a problem for Jonah. This is where the book of Jonah stops being a comic strip and ends up being kind of a, an exposition of his heart. Until now, we have had those Jacques Clouseau parallels. We have had a humorous, bumbling prophet he, who flees from God instead of obeying, who fails to intercede for the mariners in the storm, who asks to be thrown overboard rather than obey God, who finally obeys half-heartedly and goes one third across the city who um, only gives a five-word sermon, and yet he succeeds in obtaining repentance. But now we see that his heart is in trouble, that things are going wrong for Jonah, that he is realizing that God is more compassionate than him. And he quotes this verse in uh, Jonah 4, verse 1 and 2. He says, uh, or the, the, the writer says, but it displeased Jonah exceedingly, the repentance and God's relenting on Israel or on Nineveh. He's displeased by this. And he was angry and he prayed to the Lord and said, Oh Lord, is this not what I said when I was yet in my country? That is why I made haste to flee to Tarshish, for I knew that you are a gracious and merciful God, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and relenting from disaster. In this verse, Jonah is quoting Exodus 34, verse 6 to 8, which is a verse where Moses receives this declaration of God's character. He's standing on the mountain in the cleft of the rock and God tells him, who he is, that he is a gracious God and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and relenting from disaster. And throughout scripture, this verse is repeated over and over and over again as a promise to Israel in the midst of their sin and in the midst of their um, rebellion against God, that God will be compassionate, that he'll be gracious. And so it comes up in Numbers 14 and Psalm 86 and Psalm 103 and Psalm 145 and in Joel 2.13, another prophetic scroll all with this idea like God loves us and he cares for us. And yet Jonah here is saying it as an indictment because this is showing that God actually cares and has compassion and has grace for his enemies as well, not just for his people. Sometimes when we've gone on our pastor elder retreat down in Washington, uh, there's a game that comes out and it's called Moods. It's a game where you have to read a card and you have to say it in different um, different moods depending on whether you're wanting to say it romantically or whether you're wanting to say it angrily or happily and people have to guess what mood you're saying this in and so generally when exodus 34 6 to 8 would be said in scripture it would be like this comforting word of to his people that god is with us he's compassionate and gracious but you could almost hear jonah being told this or saying this in an angry 
in that angry tone, I knew that you were a gracious God and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and relenting from disaster. He's angry about this character trait of God because it's not on behalf of him. It's not on behalf of the Israelites. This displeases Jonah. God's character displeases Jonah and he is angry. So when God saves, Jonah 1 to 3, we're going to just do that last part quickly, then Jonah complains. God is more compassionate than his people. So we pick up that story, Jonah 4, 1 to 4. Uh, we hear Jonah complaining about God's mercy, about him being slow to anger. And then in verse 3, he says this, Therefore, because of your graciousness, because of your compassion, O Lord, please take my life from me. For it is better for me to die than to live. And the Lord said, do you do well to be angry? Two times in this chapter, Jonah asks to die, and God, two times God asks, do you do well to be angry? This is a question that should sit with us, should sit in our hearts as we think about God's compassion for people who we do not love, for people that we are fearful of. Do you do well to be angry? Jonah complains, first of all, about God's compassion. This is the first couple of verses, verse 1 to 4. It displeased Jonah. It, the fact that God relented of disaster, this dis displeased him. He wanted the destruction. He wanted the judgment of potential threats to Israel. He did not want the salvation of this nation. So have you ever been there? It may be hard for us to access uh, in an area like we live in where there's relative political peace. We don't have a lot of political enemies. But I imagine if you're a refugee from another country that's come here, you may have those people in your mind, those political enemies that you experience in your home country. Just today, we read about the Nigerian girls who were, or, who were rescued um, from their slave captors. They were taken for several days, 300 girls out of a school. If you were a mom of one of those Nigerian slave girls, you would have this enemy pop into your mind pretty quick. Uh, we have been kind of sheltered from that here in the West. But currently, I think we could think about looming political danger to us as Christians. We know that on the horizon, there are potential threats. People that could run us through uh, social media. People who could say all kinds of nasty things about the Lord, about our church. We can think of people who are very hostile and very openly hostile to, Christian, to the Christian faith. Aggressive atheists, some gender activists, some proponents of MAID, some pro-choice um, activists that would be very anti-Christian, and we can think of them as our enemies. So I want you to think about when you open Facebook or Instagram or Twitter, what kind of, kind of psychological warfare online makes you afraid? What kind of people would you not want to minister to? If God said, take the gospel to that person, what person would make you afraid? If you think of gathering and family gatherings or friendship circles, is, is there a specific person that comes to mind that makes you afraid because you're, you know their views are so different than your own? You know their values are so different from the, your own and you don't know how to engage with that person. You see them in your mind, maybe not as a political enemy, but somehow they're the enemy. Somehow they make you uncomfortable. We can easily perceive an individual or a group as a threat and then we can lie, draw lines around ourselves and we, be, we can be quick to vilify those people. We can be quick to say they're outside our circle. That threat causes us to kind of circle our wagons and to think about ourselves and not reach out to those people with God's compassion. Christians can be hateful on social media. Christians can be hateful for those, with those who disagree. Is that because we're afraid? Is that because we see them as a threat? like Jonah saw the Ninevites as a threat. Jonah complains because our God is a gracious God and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and relenting from disaster, even to those who threaten his people. God saves and Jonah complains because God is more compassionate than his people. So Jonah complains, first of all, just about God's compassion towards these people who threaten him. And secondly, he complains about a lack of comfort. So in chapter 4, verse 5 to 10, the way the book ends, uh, Jonah kind of stomps out of the city. You can kind of see him like s placing himself on the hillside, builds this little booth that we hear about for like half a verse and then never shows up again. Uh, he hopes that God will still judge. He sits down to wait to see if God's actually going to judge the city. Uh, there's a plant that comes up 
to shade him. It says that God appoints the plant and that makes Jonah happy. And then there's a worm the next day that comes and eats the plant and that makes Jonah sad because the plant dies. And then God appoints an east wind uh, to make Jonah kind of miserable and he's super angry. And again, he asks God if he can just die. And so the, the book ends with these ver words, verses 9 and 10. But God said to Jonah, do you do well to be angry for the plant? And he said, yes, I do well to be angry, angry enough to die. And the Lord said, you pity the plant for which you did not labor, nor did you make it grow, which came into being in a night and perished in a night. And yet, should I not pity Nineveh, that great city in which there are more than 120,000 persons who do not know their right hand from their left and also much cattle? For Jonah, his own comfort was more important to him than the salvation of many souls. And God said, I made these people. There's 120,000 of them. They're important to me. I'm all for the salvation of their souls. And so we need to again, look at ourselves in the mirror and compare ourselves to Jonah. Is our comfort more important to us than the salvation of many souls? Is our financial comfort more important to us than the salvation of many souls? Do we want a big bank account? Do we want that security of knowing where we're going to be in the future? Or are we ready to serve God regardless? Are we ready to take our eyes off our worries and set them on the kingdom of the Lord? As he says, seek first my kingdom and all these things will be added to you as well. Is your financial comfort more important to you than the salvation of many souls? Is relational comfort more important to you than the salvation of many souls? Sometimes we want to stick with the people we know. The people that make us comfortable, the people that make us happy, the people that make us feel safe. We want to stick with our established friends. We want to stick with our established family. And God says, why don't you reach out to those, that people group? Why don't you get to know sign language so you can get to know the deaf people at church? How about ministering to the homeless? How about ministering to the drug addicted? Where is your level of comfort? in these situations and how important is it to you that God seeks the salvation of many souls? Does your desire for relational comfort trump your desire to see the salvation of many souls? A couple of years ago, I was kind of thrust into a setting with a whole group of people and I was kind of angry about it. I was in a situation where I was really uncomfortable and it was a long time that I was with this group of people. There were some painful circumstances in the midst of it and I was angry at God and I wanted out. And I remember sitting in church one day wrestling with some of these emotions and wrestling with some of this anger about it and Ezra was preaching a sermon and Ezra's words that he kept repeating over and over again was that God has gospel purposes in every detour of our lives. And that spoke directly to my heart that at that moment, I was seeing this detour as something that was not of God. I was angry about the detour. And Ezra was encouraging me to think about the fact that God has gospel purposes even here. We don't want to value our comfort more than the salvation of many souls. And so I repented right there on the moment. And I said, Lord, how can you use me in this uncomfortable situation to see people saved? Teach me to put aside my personal comfort for the salvation of many souls. So the truth of our God in Jonah, uh, the truth of God throughout scripture is that he is more compassionate than his people. He is a gracious God and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and relenting from disaster. So I want to leave you with a question to think about. How can we change our mindset if we feel that we are like Jonah? What's the solution for people like us who um, get angry instead of seeing God's heart for the salvation of many souls? If God asked you, do you do well to be angry? How can you change that anger in your heart? I think one of the key things that we need to remember is that we too are by nature God's enemies. We too do not deserve God's grace. And Jonah forgot that. In Deuteronomy 8, Moses, uh, through the Lord, tells the people of Israel, like, remember, you're nothing special. Deuteronomy 7, verse 7, it was not because you were more in number than any other people on the earth that God set his love on you and chose you, for you were the fewest of all people. But it is because the Lord loves you and is keeping the oath that he swore to your fathers that the Lord has brought you out with a mighty hand and redeemed you. You are here. You're in relationship with the Lord because of his grace. You don't deserve it. 
Abraham, your forefather, was an idol worshiper. He was called because of God's mercy, because of his grace. And so you do not deserve any special standing before the Lord. And so Jonah should have remembered that as a nation of Israel, that they were chosen by God and they were given special standing as a result of God's grace. And we need to remember that as 21st century Christians, that we are, don't deserve God's mercy. Romans 3, 22b to, 22, to 25 says, For there is no distinction. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and are justified by his grace as a gift. Through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God put forward as a propitiation by, the blood, by his blood to be received by faith. None of us deserve it. None of us deserve to be saved. Romans 5, 8 to 10 says, But God shows his love for us, and yet, in that while we were still sinners, like the Ninevites, like the Israelites, Christ died for us. For if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, much more, now that we are reconciled, shall we be saved to life. God is more compassionate than his people. God had compassion on you, God had compassion on me, and in order to, for us to be like the Lord, um, we need to remember his compassion on us. So why don't I pray to that end, uh, and then you guys can discuss this in your groups. Father, I thank you uh, for the compassion that you had on me, for the compassion that you have daily on me. When I think of all the different ways that I could go astray, all the different ways uh, in the past when I've kind of set up these barriers against you and said, I'm not going to serve you, you could have just left me there. You could have not called me back to serve you. You could have just left me in my rebellion, left me in my anger and my frustration. And yet you chose to, to woo me out of that, to get me back on my feet, to cause me to keep trusting you. Lord, none of us without you uh, would be in relationship with you. You're the one that opens our hearts to understand the glory of the gospel. You're the one who sent your son to, um, to die on the cross for us so that our sins can be forgiven. You're the one who's initiated towards everybody since the beginning of time until the end of time who will come towards you. And so, Lord, we, we don't deserve your grace. And so, Lord, I pray that you would impress upon our heart a deep joy and a deep gratitude for what you've done for us. And that that deep joy and deep gratitude would translate to the way that we reach out to other people. To the way that we extend compassion, to the way that we extend mercy, uh, to the way that we represent you on this earth. Lord, I pray that as people look at us, that they will see your compassion that they will see your heart of love and that they will know that we are yours. So we pray these things in your name by the power of your spirit. Amen.